salutations. My name is Joshua Free. Greetings. My name is Joshua Free. Greetings. My name is Joshua Free. And this is episode 10 of Medicare TV Season 4. Greetings. My name is Joshua Free. Greetings and salutations. My name is Joshua Free. Greetings. My name is Joshua Free, and we are resuming Mordecai TV Season 4. Uh, in this season, we have been talking about books, books, and lots of books. I don't plan to slow down any there. Hi there! My name is Joshua Free. Greetings. My name is Joshua Free. Greetings to uh, viewers, people of Earth and beyond. We can't really be sure who and how far uh, YouTube has been reaching these days. So as many of you know, uh, my name is Joshua Free. Uh, my name is Joshua Free. I'm the founder, director of uh, modern Mordecai movement, uh, Mordecai Babylon, developer of uh, Necronomicon, the Unlocked Bible. Greetings and welcome to episode 5 of Ascending Order. As a first this time, we actually have a question that was text to us. The phone number is actually on our website. It's good for text and voicemail. Uh, chances are I'll be too busy to answer, but feel free to text or voicemail. And the question we have for today, if I can find it, Okay, so this person didn't give their name. It's from the 385 area code. I won't give their number. It says, I've recently read the complete Anunnaki Bible. Some of these writings are shocking to me. I'm not sure if they're from ancient documents or fiction accounts. The book contains very little as to the origins of many of the documents. The Destroyer Scroll, for example. And what is the backstory on this? Also, the Book of Sajaha the Seer. How can I get the backstory on how they were discovered and translated if they were? Very interesting, several exclamation marks. So it's been a little bit of time since we've actually done the show and tell. Some of you may remember back in 2009, there were several discourses that we published from the offices. They were self-published. They were handmade by yours truly. And so, for example, we have Necronomicon, this is the Lapis Edition. And this was, uh, these were all limited to about 60 copies. Mardukai Chamberlain's was a fairly limited organization at the time. And this is also known as Liber N. And it was the Necronomicon edited by, again, yours truly. Here we have the Ruby Edition of Necronomicon Liturgy and Lore. Necronomicon Gatekeeper's Grimoire. And my version of Liber 9 or the Nine Gates of the Kingdom of Shadows. Now, these materials originally went into what became known as the Anunnaki Bible, specifically Necronomicon, the Anunnaki Bible. And it's now seen, I, I don't know, maybe 10 editions or so, uh, some of which uh, the black covered edition, you might remember, it, it's out of print now. It's a collectible Necronomicon, the Anunnaki Bible, edited by Joshua Free, yours truly. So, what it was is a co composition, an anthology of sorts, for our year one work of the Mardukai Chamberlains. This continued on with other editions, such as this one that you see here. And this is a limited edition hardcover that was released to the Chamberlains. It was also available in paperback in this format. Uh, however, 
in 2018, late 2018, uh, for for Samhain or Halloween, for those of you not as pagan oriented, uh, we launched the JFI Publishing, uh, which is Joshua Free Imprint Publishing, and it was released as Necronomicon: The Anunnaki Bible, 10th Anniversary Collector's Edition in hardcover. And this was the first time that a hardcover of the Anunnaki Bible was available to the general public. It was also released in paperback as this volume here and in the paperback edition for this one we eliminated the term necronomicon and just called it the complete anunnaki bible you can also get a kind of priestly liturgical version of this in an oversized hardcover as this right here the complete anunnaki bible with nice black cover and uh it's it's subtitled as a source book of esoteric archaeology so what what does this all entail what what is the material in this well, the tablets that you find within, whether it's the Necronomicon version or the Complete Anunnaki Bible, these were basically a, a anthology of, 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 of a collection of tablets. It's a collection of what is, and, and to answer, we're, we're basically using this video to answer directly the question that was proposed to us. You can also send in uh, your own text and your own questions to, to our offices at that number, which is found on our website, martykite.com. But essentially, this became a collaborative work. Uh, although I edited it, made the selections, uh, chose the, the presentation of, of how it's going to uh, be released to the public and to represent even Mardukite Zooism, this work essentially was a, a collaborative effort amongst uh, several high minds. And of course, now, when we're talking about where the source is, who translated it, where did this stuff come from? Well, a lot of individuals, as you, can may, you may guess, they were not so excited to be involved with a project called the Necronomicon. So I had academicians, uh, those that were pursuing a master's or a PhD that involved the ancient Near East, uh, Mesopotamian studies, Sumer, Babylon, etc. These were individuals from the University of Chicago and the University of Pennsylvania, as well as additional uh, assistance from those involved with such organizations as uh, Argentum Astrum, the Ordo Templi Orientis, even the Rosicrucian Society. They all basically made small contributions, of which I collected the, the end sum of, presented to you as the Anunnaki Bible. Again, these individuals, not interested in having their name attached to it, not interested in being recognized for their work. However, this was a scholarly, uh, a very authentic, esoteric endeavor. It was meant to bring Mesopotamia, the work of the Anunnaki, the Sumerians, the Babylonians, to the common people. Also to the Mardukite Chamberlains themselves, those who were working with our group very closely and seeking to bring to light what is now considered Mesopotamian neo-paganism. Now, we've unfortunately had to separate ourselves. The, the concept of zooism was abused and used in Iceland to represent what apparently was some kind of uh, hoax or front or means of collecting donations and, and using them for private purposes. We have no connection to those that are Icelandic zooists, or zooism as, as you might find if you research it online. So the Mardukite brand of all this is, is very unique and specific to uh, ourselves and our work. The work of the Chamberlains, now also the work of the Mardukite Academy, and the Systemology Society. This is all independent, and I've basically spent oh over a decade now involved in its relay, its development, its publications, uh, everything that you see, if you look at Mardukite.com and you look at our list of publications, all of that pretty much uh, is, is my own doing and independent of anything that you're going to find elsewhere or online or other organizations and other representations of neo-pagan uh, branches or, or flavors of, of Mesopotamian revival. Now, to answer the question specifically, the Book of Zajaha the Seer was originally presented in German. 
And if you do your research, you'll find out that the German archaeologists back in the 18, mid-1800s, they are the ones that were responsible for discovering Babylon. And so, uh, as, as many scholars know, and if you were to do some additional research, what you will find is that most of the original tablet renderings are found in either German or French. These were the nations that participated in archaeological discoveries concerning the cuneiform tablets and so forth. So, what the Book of Sajaha the Seer specifically was uh, attached to as some of you may be familiar with, is called the Brill Society. And so that particular collection of cuneiform tablets was originally, uh, and, and this means specifically going back to World War II, and, and yes, the work that was sponsored by the Nazis, but the Book of Sajaha the Seer was originally the ownership or in the possession of the Brill Society. Now, in terms of the other uh, question there and uh, concerning other tablets, other work, other translations. Uh, for example, the destroyer skull, scroll. Now this is something that we look elsewhere. We find bronze tablets that are in Celtic languages that spread across Europe from Mesopotamia and became in the possession of the Celtic Kaldi and of course the Druids. And so this is actually work found from the, what is known as the Colburn Bible. So there is no work within Necronomicon, the Anunnaki Bible, that is actually fabricated, fictional, has nothing to do with H.P. Lovecraft except for the title. And there are other videos and other commentaries that regard that uh, concerning why we chose the term Necronomicon. For example, it's well known, and I've, I've not only said this in other videos, I have described this on various radio shows and podcasts and things over the last 13, 14 years, that to originally present this material as Mesopotamian neo-paganism, it wasn't going to be received as well. It wasn't going to be understood. It wasn't going to be accepted. Uh, I suppose the same could be said in presenting it as the Necronomicon. Now, unfortunately, up until the 1970s, there was very little, if any, representation of Mesopotamia. And we're talking about the oldest writings on the planet, the oldest traditions, the birthplace of the archetype of systems, and so on and so forth. There was no representation of it in occultism, modern magic, modern traditions, or anything of that sort. You see uh, various representations of the Greek fraternities and, and their system. You see all kinds of Norse and Celtic mythologies being represented, being revived. All of this under the, the banner of neo-paganism, the New Age, even Wicca. But the one thing that you didn't find was Mesopotamia. And this is something that's only actually been developed as of recently. And, and perhaps also uh, due to the efforts of Zechariah Sitchin. Now, in 1977, enter the Simon Necronomicon. And it's no big mystery that the Simon Necronomicon was not an ancient manuscript, was not an ancient, well, ancient anything. It was inspired by H.P. Lovecraft. But what it did do is it took several works, specifically Babylonian myth and magic, Chaldean magic, and Semitic magic, all of which have been reprinted in hardcover by a publishing company named Samuel Weiser. You also find it interesting that Samuel Weiser also represents the more modern hardcover 31st anniversary edition of the Simon Necronomicon. Whether they do it under Samuel Weiser or one of their other imprints known as Ibis Press. So that whole representation has actually been kind of monopolized up until the Mardukite True Seeker Press and what is now the JFI Publishing. Concerning Mesopotamian magic, Semitic magic, Babylonian magic, all of that stuff. So, up until 1977, there was no representation. As of 1977, the only real contribution up until the establishment of the Mardukites in 2009, actually it was established in 2008, the Chamberlains were established in 2009, it was the Simon Necronomicon. And so, being that it was a incomplete, bastardized edition of what would otherwise be a masterpiece, of Mesopotamian mysticism, I decided to collect the works, not only from the discourses that I showed you that were self-published, but also several others, including the Book of Mardukai Nabu, the Book of Sajaha the Seer, 
and several several other key pieces which have ended up being composed into uh, the Anunnaki Bible, as you see it in the complete form, the complete Anunnaki Bible, or Necronomicon, the complete Anunnaki Bible. The master edition that we use at the Marnakite Academy is known as Necronomicon, the complete Anunnaki Legacy, and that's this thousand page hardcover tome here. And this not only includes the materials within Necronomicon, the Anunnaki Bible, uh, the anthology that we've been speaking of here, but also the gates of the Necronomicon anthology and Necronomicon Grimoire. So there's actually 16 books total that compose this thousand page hardcover Necronomicon, the complete Anunnaki legacy. It contains the complete grade two materials that we use at the Mardukai Academy. So now then, one of the things that we've been working on recently, I'm, I'm currently in the process of setting them up for you, as has been promised, the uh, complete Mardukite Master Course. The lectures that I gave back in September 2020, there were 48 of them, the transcripts are all contained within this large volume. Now, one of the things we're doing to make it easier and more concise for individuals and be able to purchase it in installments is to break this material down and deliver it as four volumes. Now, this is the reverse of what we normally do. We normally take a series of books and put it into a large anthology. In this case, we're actually taking what became a large anthology from its start, from its inception, as soon as the uh, master course was completed, and breaking it down into four. That includes uh, grade one, route A, which is specifically magic and mysticism, deals with the great magical arcanum. That will be one volume. and and. The, that will contain the transcripts for lectures given for Grade 1 Route A. Grade 1 Route D concerns the Druids, the Elves, uh, Dragon Tradition, and so forth. That will be a second volume. The Grade 2 material pertains specifically to Mardukite, uh, Mesopotamian Tradition, the Anunnaki, Sumerians, Babylonians, and so forth. That will be a particular volume. And finally, Grade 3, which is how we launched Mardukite Systemology. That will be in one volume. So we are working on that. And now that we've talked your ear off a little bit for about 15 minutes, the next thing we're going to introduce to you is what is Lecture 5. Lecture 5 from the Mardukite Master Course. This is a recording. When you come to the Academy, since I no longer give the Mardukite Master Course personally, I'm available, of course, for questions and work, but if you were to attend the Academy today, you would basically be listening to a lot of audio recordings and be given a lot of literary materials to go through. And lecture five is called The Magic School. So without further ado, I will turn you over to the Marakite Master Course. This is a lecture titled The Magic School. This lecture is 30 minutes long as given by Joshua Free in September 2020, produced by the Mardukite Academy of Systemology, all rights reserved. All right, I want to welcome you all back this morning. It is September the 22nd we have here. And on the itinerary, shows I got you for about five hours. So that should allow four hours of lecture plus breaks. And according to our schedule, we are to talk about grade one magic schools, which is always something of significant interest. Uh, it's, you know, we, we covered a bit about uh, entering people onto the levels and the gradients and the entry points uh, yesterday in yesterday's lectures. So today we're talking about magic schools, your magic school, your magic school representing uh, the Mardukite Master Course, the Mardukite Academy, uh, any of your local lodges or chapters, uh, courses that might be offered uh, through a chapter of the Church of Zoism, Church of Mardukite Zoism. Um, so let's really just get right into this. So magic schools, we've got really, you know, magic's been separated into a lot of factions and divisions these days. Uh, we've kind of di even divided ourselves in grade one you'll see we've got cycle A, cycle D, 
uh, or, or Route A, Route D in terms of the literature and the training concerning general magic of the Arcanum material and then of course an emphasis on European magic in the form of Druidism and it ties in to the former Mesopotamian tradition. So where that gives you, you have a lot of various uh, magicians, we've got sorcerers, we've got witchcraft, we've got druidry, uh, shamanism would fall within that parameter of grade one, uh, all these various titles and so forth. Uh, I mean, technically, you know, when we released Arcanum, we needed to make sure that things were cohesive for uh, its release in, in terms of publishing and uh, the, the way books are set up and titled and so forth. So we called it a master course in magic for modern wizards. As you know, here in, in the, the academy in systemology, we treat the wizard levels as grades four and above, as wizard grades. Below, we're dealing with master grades. And so uh, to be a master magician then uh, would be probably more accurate and we were not really concerned with gender titles in this uh, druid, druidess, uh, a witch or warlock, you know, with, that's that's all stuff that that kind of gets flattened out in grade one uh, as as a seeker explores all of the various parameters and divisions of, of what constitutes as magic, what constitutes as magic using the semantics of uh, perhaps uh, the, the Druidic or perhaps uh, uh, an earth-oriented uh, tradition or Wicca versus high magic, ceremonial magic, uh, works from the Golden Dawn, uh, Israel Regarde, uh, Aleister Crowley, and so forth. These, the, there's, there, there's really only one magic, and, and, and the fundamental of magic, if we want to break it down, is energy. Right? I mean, that's what we're dealing with at any every point. And the interesting thing is, is as we move farther and farther along this course, uh, up the grades, you're dealing mainly still with just energy. But it's how is it being understood? How is it being treated? Uh, these things change as we move up the grades until we're really just dealing with energies as they are in their blatant raw flow uh, and, and, and cycles and generations and all of that at the alpha levels. Alpha spirit generating energies, generating viewpoints, uh, generating uh, mental imagery. We're, we're not, nothing really changes except our refinement and our understanding of the practice and our involvement and participation in this as we move up the grades. So even if, if you're working with, uh, you know, for over two decades now, uh, if you've been working with the Sorcerer's Handbook, uh, I've I've started it for each edition the same way. The core of magic opens with a section on energy, and the blanket statement that it exists in all things. It's the driving force behind all magic. I mean, there it is. That's you know you're dealing with energy. Uh, everything else is secondary to that. Uh, in magic, we tend to deal a lot with symbols, and we deal a lot with representations. Uh, in sympathetic magic, the concept of sympathetic magic, which is almost uh, more of an anthropological uh, scientific term, but in, in that we use representations of something as they're connected to something else. Uh, so example, you have a, a piece of hair from somebody and so that has their, well, I mean, well we know now hair has actually genetic material. You know, when we consider, when we look back at these old grimoires, they say, oh, we collect these pieces of hair, uh, fingernails, uh, certain things like that, these articles of clothing that may contain sweat, uh, an individual's blood. Uh, we, we, we look at that now and we see, well, maybe that's not so ridiculous because there is definitely an energetic connection, if we were to give it the significance of one, uh, between having those types of articles and then, of course, the uh, ways in which those are used or implemented, the belief that by having those types of articles, uh, there is a certain power or a certain connection that may be demonstrated. And therefore an energetic flow that can be connected, a communication of energies that can be connected presumably across distances. Because presumably uh, the way that we see space and time in this, in this universe, we are of course dealing with only agreements concerning a material physical universe uh, as, as they're affected here.
and that's one of the things you need to understand with magic because magic is most often uh, a concern of affecting as things are in the physical universe so you're dealing with the collision of two universes there you're dealing with the universe of the magician and you're dealing with the physical universe the agreed upon universe in which uh, the they've chosen to inhabit uh, or been enforced or enslaved or however we want to look at this later on in, in, in the gradients to inhabit the point of view of a physical body, a genetic vehicle, an incarnation within the physical universe, whether they be magicians or whatever, that's all about the will and knowledge and aptitude of the self, the seeker, has nothing to do with the physical body. The physical body is simply the means in which we are using to communicate in a physical universe that is agreed upon with other physical bodies that are used as point of views from other identities. That doesn't mean we're actually entrapped into this universe. Only our point of view and our considerations uh, during the degradation of lifetimes and beliefs and all the conditioning and imprint, implants and imprinting that's taken place, you know, we've come now down to this, this lower level of, of understanding and this lower level of being and this lower level of, of confining our point of view down here in order to interact and communicate with this existence that's taking place and so we must always keep these these elements in mind if we're going to have this higher master understanding of grade one work otherwise we would still just treat grade one work as the end-all be-all and it's all magic schools there's nothing beyond that nothing came before nothing could be understood from kinetoform tablets there's nothing new we can take this to in the future and we would basically just have a persistent uh, ex uh, piece of knowledge that would actually probably degrade it would, since it's not bringing us any farther what would tend to happen is that knowledge as we can chart across time would continue to degrade and what we would be left with is lower and lower points of consideration which is what we see this is what we see the direction happening when those are not when individuals are not moving up and out into higher plateaus of awareness higher points of actualized awareness ledges of knowing and what we demonstrate as the grades go forward. So as a master, yes, we're going to still be offering magic schools because just as you or I or another individual might have best been introduced or use this as an entry point to get out of the earth gate and to begin to consider uh, more possibilities and potential for self, we're not going to exclude this. However, we've done so much more research, so much more research discovery, experimentations, the development of uh, systemology and its processing methods and so forth that uh, we need to not forget that we are still coming from a higher perspective and looking at this now. Uh, so long as we aren't overwhelming seekers at an educational level. But basically, when it comes to the, the Mardukite Master Course, as I deliver it to you, and uh, any of these grades as they're divided or brought to curriculum-based uh, courses uh, at your lodges or personal apprenticeships, everything in, from in the course, grades one through three, is pretty much fair game here as an understanding and to be pulled from. Uh, so long as we don't start going into systemology piloting or piloted processing. Everything up until that point, uh, which includes material from Tablets, Destiny, and Crystal Clear, uh, all of these points of understanding, this is expected for a master to understand so that in relaying uh, the core of magic here or uh, the witchcraft traditions or any of these lower stuff to the people that need to receive this knowledge, understand it, get it flattened, not be reactive, to it, not have it uh, trip them up or be stuck in it in any way, and to be able to move past those paradigms into higher points of understanding. Uh, it's, it's also necessary for the pilot to fully understand both the viewpoint of the seeker that's at that level of understanding, but also not lose their place and their point on the pathway in uh, staying involved with these subjects because uh, that's something we've noticed that a lot of systemologists actually as the routes have gone on uh, have done and which is fine as a personal path you know you've been through it you want to shut it move up keep working on personal uh, development that's that's encouraged that's what this is all about now of course with the Mardukai Academy with the uh, founding church of Mardukai Zooism with our uh, society of systemology we're concerned also with the delivery of this information to a point beyond just myself 
you know, beyond just myself as a founder or originator or an author or uh, sitting up in some ivory tower somewhere just speaking to you guys or a handful of individuals online or so on, uh, because the materials themselves have a far reach now. We have larger global distribution with our printed material than ever before. The higher level understanding should follow with that and the personal instruction, the relay of information and much more candid, fluid, higher points of understanding such as the Mardukite Master Course which can't really be duplicated in the printed word. We can later go back and release these as transcripts but it's not the same as uh, hearing it, uh, being able to register it, looking at the books first and then getting someone uh, or like myself or one of our other instructors to give overviews of, of various things or answer questions, um, which I do encourage uh, during this course period, uh, if you can write down, those of you that are present here, because we're recording these, you can write down your questions about the materials at each grade as we're working through it and then in next lectures I can kind of relay that to everybody because uh, I think a Q&A here with the microphone and everything would be really hard to pick up so if we could do it that way. Now so the core of magic we deal with energy uh, it's first and foremost in the Sorcerer's Handbook and honestly all through the grades that's what we're dealing with is energy. Uh, we're never really departing from that. Uh, and more, more importantly, we are trying to get the seeker to basically break more and more of their agreements, the agreements of reality concerning the physical universe and them, those being the only considerations for how, it, how things can be. This is only one universe and we know that we are occupying it as a point of view from a higher point of awareness somewhere else. We know that. We've been able to establish that in even traditional magic, uh, although the semantics get gray. Uh, we've been able to find it on the most ancient of cuneiform tablets, uh, but it's probably best presented in our newer version of Next Gen and Mardukite systemology. Uh, I mean, almost a year ago when I presented the Power of Zoo lectures, which are uh, in the uh, instructor's manual of the Master Course uh, Instructor's Edition, uh, it's the same principle was was being applied. We were trying to understand a way of unifying our, under, our our presentation of this because what we are now calling zoo that that is just one and of course zoo isn't being named for that. That is just one semantic, but it was a good one and it was an old one. And what it represented was a way of very simply defining the spiritual energy continuum and life force that extends from self, that self projects out from its remote alpha spirit point in which to engage and reach and develop and manifest and apply energies and efforts uh, to existence, to what we know as reality. And so zoo is, uh, it's what in, in former uh, systemology presentations nearly a decade ago, we were calling it a monistic continuum. And the concept of a monistic continuum is that you have a singular force which simply has varying degrees of manifestation and expression based on the interactions at those various degrees. So it's not that the energy itself is changing, the zoo energy, the, the identity of self, actualized awareness being sent out to have an experience, to project, to receive, uh, to uh, accept and reject, to reach and withdraw, this is all coming from a, virtually a static point. And then you see this, this expression of self or spirit or however you want to call it, you see it basically condensing and changing as it extends itself towards the, well, physical point of view in our case. So we are all, we're all kind of still occupying these physical bodies as a point of view, a point of view only. So we, we know better than to say that we are these bodies. So what are we dealing with? We're dealing with an alpha spirit and then we have what it directs in a spiritual domain or a spiritual dimension or a spiritual universe, okay, as its own prime thought, its own directive thought in a completely raw and, and spiritually energetic form, which is then expressed downward as will, okay, the willpower. Willpower is what engages the mind system and as a being a directive, causative point of view and source. Okay, so now we have willpower and the mind system. The mind system is actually attached to 
uh, not only what you carry with you between lives, but also the systems of, of how you've uh, operated this particular one. So we consider the mind system now part of the beta universe, which is the physical universe. It may not be as solid uh, in terms of its solidification and concentration of energy particles as, as for example, this, this table, but we are dealing with a beta existence at that juncture. The mind is mainly there to determine or gauge or evaluate the amount of effort that is needed and how it is to be applied to get or, or result in the right effect at the physical universe level, because that's what we're here changing, uh, particularly at the magic level. I mean, although people speak of ascension, we talk of holy magic and high magic, at the magical level, we're still pretty much concerned with the material universe. And for some, that's a good, that's a good step. That's a big gradient to just get up to being at a point of cause in the physical universe, because obviously this is a game field that we are very much working with. Now, when it comes to the, the classification of energy, this is where things start to get murky. And this is where the master and, and instructors really come in handy in keeping a seeker on track, unified understanding of energies because in one place they're going to be reading a lot or learning a lot about light, rays of light, the lights, whether it's astral light, spiritual light, uh, divine light, uh, light uh, comes up a lot. Um, any type of energy, any, anywhere where subtle energies or universal energies, cosmic energy, anytime the term energy is even blatantly used, uh, they're gonna, when, you, when you deal with uh, certain forms of ascension, they talk a lot about the God mind, uh, divine sparks, a god force, things of that nature. Uh, each language, depending on if you're dealing with, you know, the Semitic Kabbalah, you're dealing with Babylon, you're dealing with the Druids, each language classifies its own uh, observance of the same type of energy in its own way. And uh, there are some that have still not come to the unified understanding that this is all, we are speaking of the same spiritual energy or the same vital energies uh, you know, that regardless of paradigm. And this is really, really important because uh, if you keep grade one fragmented, see the purpose of grade one wasn't to necessarily show in Arcanum how widely dispersed we can, we can make all this knowledge and, uh, and keep it, and keep it dispersed. The purpose of it was unification, pure and foremost. Uh, this, the concepts of magic, uh, the ones that work, you know, the, the nitty gritty of magic that actually is effective and workable and actually uh, serves a function, uh, continues to serve a function as you move up the grades. It isn't just something that, uh, you know, oh, well, that was useful at one point, but it's no longer. The true heart of it all is really very simple and is really the, what we're trying to break down here uh, as a master course or in analyzing grade one now from a systemological level uh, blatantly. I mean, we've talked to magic systems before. We've talked of taking systematic approaches, but now with the completion of grade three and the master course, there's no excuses. There's just no excuses for lower levels of understanding to be held onto in that respect. So, um, now that's that's one of the things that we're going to be confronting here and that you've already dealt with in overcoming certain mental barriers and programming barriers and so forth is again breaking those agreements with the physical universe with the material universe the programming of it the understanding of it that's been conditioned from the physical sciences because uh, don't forget we're going into two directions here we're going into the direction where we are moving into a uh, more than human, metahuman, alpha spiritual uh, point of development in our systemology and our zooism. And that is in complete conflict with the solidity and, and concrete uh, nature of material sciences, which uh, are anything but imaginative. Uh, although they may have started on some very uh, curious and philosophical premises, they became way 
uh, way more narrowed down and and condensed as time went on it's, it's, it's like painting a canvas uh, you're working with the canvas and at first uh, they're really it's it's just a free form and you know anything goes you start to create a little bit of a form you start to shape things in a certain way decide that you're going to uh, pinpoint uh, well now this is going to be the basic form of a tree and maybe we'll put a building over there now you may not have solidified this form entirely yet but you have begun to place parameters on what something is going to be the potential of that once infinite being this and now we have begin to create some kind of form and that is what we begin to see uh, handled more and more uh, when a practitioner is operating with magic, what are they operating with? So we we talked just briefly so far about energy. Well, what else are they operating with? What's the other aspect of the mind? mental image pictures, mental imagery, imagery, imagination, uh, the visualization. That that's it. You got visualization. You got energy. You've got the awareness of the individual connecting the two. That's it. I mean, that's that's magic in a nutshell. Now I could just as easily say, okay, well, that's, that's it. Now I'll go home. But now, obviously that, even that basic understanding is probably not very unique or original. We've had these kind of premises and, and axioms uh, set before us in the past. What we're trying to do is work our way up a pattern of workability and effectiveness, something that's practical. And for those that the gradient scale of just uh, creating prime thought or alpha thought or postulating or simply willing to be that things are a certain way you're feeling a certain way uh, suddenly you're going to just decide I'm gonna be a different way or you're interacting with something and suddenly you're reacting and you and you're you're feeling all this programming triggering up inside you and so what and and you and you say you know I'm, I I see that and I'm going to not succumb to that I'm not going to be the effect of some some program or some conditioned set of pattern behaviors or thought trails that has dictated that well the next time this happens this is all my associative knowledge with that and well I know what that is and and so on and okay because that that's basically what we're doing at the material level the physical universe level is we basically come up with the lowest level or the lowest common denominator of beliefs and agreements to create a solid existence a beta existence to, to share communications in and this is the lowest common denominator and this has not been the lowest common denominator always you see and there is a downward uh, kind of trail uh, or slide that seems to take place as societies and existences uh, each lifetime the cultures the way in which the universe is treated as real and it's becoming more and more and more and more solid and that's only as a result of the awareness and attention and persistence that is placed upon it because we can't really even be certain that uh, even at the physical science levels of of cosmology and and astronomy and so forth that we actually understand the backbone behind this universe from a physical science level we have a better chance of that by moving our awareness points outside of this universe than we do in using any of these instruments and uh, the type of calculations and observations that are fixed and confined to specific scientific parameters to understand and we don't know uh, that this universe was even created in a physical sense or actually being willed willed into being and kept in persistence by our participation by our ability to interact with it and direct forces within it from this perspective you're 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 directing your awareness into this body and from that you are looking outward and interacting with energies and you have been conditioned from birth about forms about shapes about colors about the significances distance time and to say that these things are an illusion now which is a slippery slope I must say there are a lot of magical paths that'll do that and that removes full responsibility full ability to command or control and full ability to know or do within those domains and you then become the effect of so that's something to keep in mind 
which is why I, I, I expressed this lecture and we're, we're approaching magic school in this kind of high refined uh, system, systemological and intellectual way. Because you have to keep this other element in mind too, that these systems are also spiritual traps. That these levels and these gradients were each meant to confine a certain understanding. And as we move farther back, we see a wider understanding and a wider understanding. And as we look from the most current magical applications and grimoires of the last few hundred years and traditions, we become more refined and systematic with it, more rigid uh, in terms of magical correspondences, the associations, and so forth. And that's the type of stuff that we uncover in grade one because we need to flatten those. We need to flatten the understandings that things de-evolve de to this point. Uh, because when we look previous to that, the, what they were actually based on, for example, in Mesopotamia, and what we uncover in grade two, we don't find as much rigidity. We don't find as much uh, very specific uh, points that have to be met in terms of ability. In there, we see a more divine practice. We see prayer. We see a communication uh, still taking place between uh, something which is outside of this environment, which may have been represented at some point by physical deities, which may have later been represented by at some point by more human uh, priests and priestesses, and then de-evolved into our systems of government and so on and so forth. But in the beginning, it wasn't, it was not nearly as, as refined and as rigid and as structured, although there was definitely a systemization at play. Uh, but the considerations for that systemization were not nearly as fixed to the symbolism, which is about all they were able to hold on to once considerations drop down another level thereafter. Uh, and as we enter the period, the more classical periods, Greco-Roman, even the more uh, the Neo-Babylonian period of Nebuchadnezzar and the arrival of the Talmudic Jewish tradition, the Kabbalah, and the development of uh, ceremonial magic as it ended up entering into the medieval periods later, we see way more calculations, refinements, uh, structures, rules, uh, correspondences, and all of which, if they aren't met, lead to invalidating that the individual has the ability to create change in accordance with will for this physical existence. And at the end of the day, we know that that really is all that magic is. And we can basically work from these fundamentals that energy is everything, magic is basically the understanding and use of energy, control and command of it, uh, mastering magic has to do with uh, breaking agreements with the material universe, the physical beta universe as it stands, as it's been agreed to as a commonality, and then also being able to apply will, apply energy to direct uh, the changes that are desired in this existence. And if you can do all that, you have magic.